Hello and welcome to the finale of the trilogy on Arctic Amplification, a process by which the Arctic warms up faster than the rest of the globe. In the first part, we discuss some of the positive feedback loops that cause global warming to be more pronounced in the Arctic as opposed to the rest of the world. Mind you, we did not discuss the reason behind global warming, but since you're watching this video, I presume you are all aware that it is primarily due to anthropogenic, so human-generated, carbon emissions. Next up in part 2, we discussed what a warmer arctic spells out for our planet, specifically the oceans, the land masses, and the atmosphere. One thing we haven't discussed up to now is how is all of this relevant to us. So what if the arctic melts a bit? Most of the world population is not even above the arctic circle, let alone the fact that nobody lives on the desolate arctic sea ice mass, what most people imagine when the arctic is mentioned except polar bears, and they can swim, right? Besides, so what if the Arctic is warming two to four times faster than the rest of the world? They have terrible winters up there anyway. Surely people living above the Arctic Circle will appreciate the extra warmth, right? So if anything, Arctic amplification is a good thing, no? Nope, it's really not. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll see why. We'll dive into the science in the same order as we did in part two which was oceans, then land, and then the atmosphere. So let's talk oceans, and perhaps the first thing that comes to mind when we're talking about the Arctic ice, oceans, and global warming is sea level rise. Climate scientists study all possible scenarios when it comes to the effect of global warming, but they can generally be subdivided into low emission scenarios and high emission scenarios, which is kind of like a metric for human stupidity. If we are dumb and do nothing about climate change and keep releasing carbon into the atmosphere like there's no tomorrow, then the high emission scenario was most likely to take place. On the other hand, if we are responsible and try to cut down our carbon emissions, then the low emission scenario is more likely to take place. In the 20th century, the rise in sea level was approximately 11 to 16 centimeters. Most estimates for the 21st century suggest less than 2 meter rise, and if you have been by the coast anywhere on Earth, you might think that's something we can handle. But the sea itself is not always at the same height, is it? No, in fact, it varies based on the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. One could say that our oceans are in fact two-timing our planet with the sun and the moon, because being fluid and relatively free to move means that you can also be affected by the gravity of distant objects while still sticking close to your home planet. Long story short, at high tide, the moment when the oceans are most unfaithful to Earth, is when even 50 more centimeters to the average sea level could cause some serious damage. And now, if you got high tide coupled with a storm surge, which is when high velocity winds essentially pile up water onto the shore, any extra amount of water could mean life or death. Interestingly, millions of people today live under the current high tide and flood limits, thanks to levees and other defenses against the rising sea level. But let me ask you, when you got a levee or a dike or a seawall that is made to combat the high tides and storm surges that can only reach a given elevation, and then all of a sudden the sea level rises above that, what do you do then? Well then comes flooding, crop failure, famine, disease, and so on. But wait. If people already live below sea level due to man-made structures, can't we just improve these structures to combat higher sea levels? Well, first of all, maybe you're lucky and you live in the Netherlands where there is an extensive flood control network. Or maybe you live in Bangladesh where floods happen all the time and a mix of lack of funds and maintenance means that there is little to no flood control. What then? And if you think you're fine just because you live far away from the coast in some landlocked alpine high elevation country, where do you think all the people who will be escaping floods will move to? Putting further strain on the food, jobs, and housing availability where you live. Before I move on, I do want to say I cheated a bit here, and do want to clarify that sea level rise is not just caused by arctic amplification, but also by the regular global warming melting the Antarctic ice sheet, the largest single mass of ice on Earth. Because if you remember from the last video in this series, the Arctic is mostly sea ice, which means it's frozen seawater that cannot result in sea level rise unlike land ice. But Greenland, the second largest single mass of ice in the Arctic, can result in sea level rise. Speaking of a melting Greenland, in part 2 we established 
what the Atlantic Meridional overturning circulation was and why it is being slowed down. In this video, I promise to tell you what that means for us humans. If you watch the movie The Day After Tomorrow and think you're an expert already, and that an amok collapse is imminent and will cause a worldwide ice age in the near future, let me stop you right there and comfort you, because luckily a complete shutdown won't happen anytime soon. In fact, the most recent IPCC report states it's much more likely that after slowing down for several decades, it will then recover to pre-decline values over several centuries. But probably you or any of the near future generations won't live to see that, and the fact is, it is slowing down right this minute, and will continue to do so in this century. Most basic and sure effect of any decline in Amok is the decrease in the heat that is brought with the warm waters from the equator. And while it does not cause an ice age, let me stop you right there if you think this will counteract Arctic amplification, because the IPCC also made it quite clear that it will have little to no effect on that. Looking at all computer models that are used to analyze these effects, we can say that with a big decline we are most likely expecting the mid-latitude thermally driven jet, which can be thought of as a dynamic tube of strong winds, not to be confused with the polar jet stream we covered in part 2, to get stronger and be shifted northward. Simply put, if the heat that is usually transferred northward stays in the south, then difference in temperature what we already discussed in part 2 of this trilogy will force these tubes to go north, which would mean the same patterns in our atmosphere that drive storms at lower latitudes will be shifted northward. With less pronounced decline in Amok, we do not see this shift, but can expect already wet areas like the UK to get wetter and dry areas like Spain to get drier, which is not good news for either of these two extremes. This is because Amok also helps with the redistribution of moisture in the North Atlantic. And it doesn't end there. Remember how Amok was simply one cog in the thermohaline circulation that connects all the oceans? While well, slowing down, Amok would also increase rains in an already wet rainy season, or monsoons, in South Asia, which ties back to the dangerous floods in Bangladesh we discussed earlier. Thus it is all connected, and I'll put in my sources a great paper that explains some of the links between places as distant as the North Atlantic and the Indian Ocean that modulates monsoons. But to save on time, I'll keep this video moving. Next up, we got land. And what we learned previously is that the land that's above the Arctic Circle has a lot of permanently frozen ground, also known as permafrost, that is reaching the end of its permanence, i.e. its thawing waking up ancient microbe communities in the process and releasing a whole bunch of carbon in the form of methane and carbon dioxide. And the result of this process couldn't be clearer. Methane and carbon dioxide are both greenhouse gases, and anyone who knows anything about climate change knows that greenhouse gases form a type of greenhouse around our globe that traps incoming heat and limits how much is radiated back out to space. So naturally, if we are emitting additional carbon and the microbes that were previously dormant are also emitting additional carbon, we're going to seriously boost the greenhouse effect on our planet. And if you are there thinking, can the greenhouse effect even be bad? I mean, isn't it what keeps us alive by not letting all the heat escape the planet every night? You'd be right. But you'd also probably be unaware of the almost entirely carbon dioxide atmosphere of Venus with unimaginably strong atmospheric pressure at its 370 degrees Celsius surface, sulfuric acid clouds and a little to no light that makes it through this incredibly dense and clouded atmosphere, all thanks to a runaway greenhouse effect which is basically a greenhouse effect that is working a little more than it should to sustain life. Last but not least, let's talk about the complicated relationship between the Arctic climate change and the jet stream, one of the most contentious topics in climate science. Here I will quickly present three mechanisms that we theorize connect the two. First, let's talk about the wavier polar jet stream. Remember how we discussed the temperature difference between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes that essentially pushes the air northward while Coriolis tugs it southward? Well, this is a careful balance achieved through this temperature difference. If this difference declines, then the jet stream as a whole weakens, 
A weak jet stream is more easily deflected by obstacles in its path, and by obstacles I mean anything from physical obstacles like mountains to temperature differences like those over the ocean. If the jet stream is wavier, well then you got cold air getting funneled southward and warm air funneled northward, lowering this difference between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes even more. Next up we got the negative state of the NAO. A what now? The NAO is the North Atlantic Oscillation, which just describes the location of different pressure systems in the North Atlantic. Pressure systems like high or low pressure systems are what decide weather on our planet and also the position of the jet stream. How they do all that is a video for another time. For now, just know that a positive NAO means that there is a strong pressure difference between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes, so very cold Arctic and mild winters at the mid-latitudes. Negative NAO means that the pressure difference is small, the Arctic is not as cold and the mid-latitude winters are way colder. We now believe, based on temperature trends since the 1990s, that the NAO is more commonly negative than positive due to Arctic amplification. Next, let's talk about the polar vortex, which exists in the stratosphere, a layer that's above the troposphere, which is the layer that we all live in. The vortex, sitting 50 kilometers above the Arctic, is surrounded by a bloated donut known as the polar night jet since it only appears during the freezing 24 hours of darkness arctic winter. Like the jet stream, the polar night jet, several kilometers above the polar jet stream, transports air west to east at the boundary between cold arctic air and warmer mid-latitude air. But instead of just getting wavier if something were to disrupt it, this donut spazzes out. And by that I mean it can wiggle, reverse direction completely or even split in two. Most importantly for us though, any disruption like this could trigger a sudden stratospheric warming, which just means that the winds in the polar night jet slow and start pushing air towards the center of the vortex, where they eventually descend, compress, and warm by as much as 50 degrees Celsius. Long story short, the donut takes a solid beating, and in its weak state, then starts dripping down the rest of its freezing stratospheric air in the troposphere, at the mid-latitudes. By now you've probably guessed where all this is going. Yes, some scientists attribute less sea ice to more of these polar vortex disturbances. Remember the waves we talked about in the jet stream due to temperature and elevation differences? Well, less sea ice and the ice albedo effect mean more of these temperature differences that cause waviness. And very important to understand here is that these waves don't just meander north-south, but can also meander from the troposphere to the stratosphere. That's because they're three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. So don't let my 2D drawings fool you. That is actually how the polar vortex and the polar night jet often get disturbed in the first place. And with more ways to get disturbed, we can expect more disturbances. Most importantly, and this is huge, this is an example of how climate change, arctic amplification, and global warming all contribute to colder winters and colder temperatures, a point that climate change deniers really enjoy bringing up. So if you were one of those people asking, well if it's warming, how can there be cold extremes? Either out of pure interest or to disprove climate change, I hope I've answered your question. You might have noticed I presented a lot of theories in part 3 of how things will play out. The reason for there being so many different theories about what can happen is because we can't say for sure to what extent these things will happen. But it's very important for everyone to understand that scientists are researching these phenomena to understand what can happen, armed with the knowledge of all we have learned about our planet's climate up till now. And the studies they conducted are perhaps the best predictions we have on how our climate will evolve even if these predictions are not exactly correct, because after all, there is plenty of uncertainty in a system as complicated as our climate. So next time you decide whether to read a paper from a respectable scientific journal on the most recent study on how climate change is predicted to impact our planet, or listen to a rant by a climate change denier, I sincerely hope I've convinced you to pick the former, 
And if a scientific paper is perhaps not something you want to spend hours on deciphering, especially if you don't have a scientific background, well that's what I'm here for. Send it over to me and if I think it's something super cool, complicated and in need of severe simplifying for the wider audience, I will do so. And if you want to see how these bite-sized simplified scientific summaries turn out, subscribe and hit that notification button. If you want to see part 1 and part 2 of this Arctic Amplification series that this part literally stands on, check them out here. And if you like the video, you can confirm uh, or inform me that you did so by clicking the like button under this video. Thanks everyone for following me on this long journey, and I hope to see you next time.